While many of us have known for a long time that beer has special properties, even the most educated beerologist never dreamed of the true destiny of this hallowed grog. But thanks to the hard work of people like Ken Grossman, who founded the Sierra Nevada Brewery, we now have a clear vision of how the very process of making beer can lead the way to a more sustainable future. In previous episodes of Green Planet, we've talked about the life cycle of a product. At the Sierra Nevada Brewery, this concept is in their blood. Visiting the brewery is like stepping into an M.C. Escher drawing. It's as if there's no beginning and no end. Everything is reused or reclaimed in an unending cycle. Even sewer water is transformed into something precious. Electricity. The genius of what Mr. Grossman has created is not just great beer or some eloquent statement about how we should treat the environment. It's that he's done all this while making a profit. Some people think that we have to be wasteful to make a profit or that sustainability is bad for the bottom line. The Sierra Nevada Brewery takes things from an entirely different perspective. It's this closed loop process that's key to sustainability. Never throwing anything away, never wasting anything, valuing everything. We're about to see how hops and water turn into electricity, how electricity turns into beer, and how beer turns into money. So raise your glass and salute to the beer that saved the world. Did you get the batteries in the charger? I can't believe it. We're going to get an interview with Ken Grossman. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Let's go. Go. Jen and I are on our way up to Chico, California to talk with Ken Grossman, the founder of the Sierra Nevada Brewery. For those of you who like beer, that's pretty exciting all by itself. But for those of you who don't, fear not. For while beer plays a very important role in our story, it turns out only to be a supporting one. We've heard an awful lot of bad news lately about what's been happening to our planet, global warming and all. And there's been a lot of talk about what to do about it. But while lots of people are talking about change, only a few people are actually doing it. And it's these people who are making the word sustainability cool. Welcome to Chico, California, where the idea of living more sustainably is part of the culture. The university here not only holds classes on it, but has woven sustainability into the curriculum and even holds an annual conference called this way to sustainability. The engineering department here at Chico State chose to use pervious concrete for their walkways. Pervious concrete allows rainwater to flow right through it naturally. The city of Chico's wastewater treatment plant generates power with a huge photovoltaic array. But it's right here at the Sierra Nevada Brewery where the concept is really put into place. Some people say it all started right here with a man named Ken Grossman. 
I was very much of a tinker when I was young. Uh, I was forever taking things apart and building things, and um, I certainly had uh, developed sort of an awareness of, of technology and, and things like solar cells uh, very early on. I had a little robot that ran on a uh, little solar cell. That awareness eventually led to this, a company that since its very inception has balanced the requirements of nature with those of a thriving business. And that dedication has led to success in many areas. Well, besides the beer, um, there's, uh, there's lots of things we've been doing for many years. Um, our recycling efforts have, have been something we've been focusing on, getting better at trying to find uses for all the things that we bring in here that, that don't end up being uh, in the beer. From stretch wrap that's on the outside of, of pallets of glass to plastic strapping that, uh, that binds some pallets together. Obviously, cardboard glass, all those kinds of things get, get recycled. We try to find uses for uh, those kinds of things when we're done with them. And if they could do it with cardboard, plastic, and glass, why not reuse all of the waste? What about the beer itself? After all, the ingredients in beer are just like the stuff we use to make bread. The spent brewing ingredients, the spent malt, the spent hops, the spent yeast, all those end up in food streams back for um, animal feed, typically. Even the yuckiest of the yuck ends up being used. The brewery's wastewater is brought right here to its own on-site wastewater treatment plant, where it's turned into something we all have, don't want, but can never get enough of. Gas. We've been treating our own wastewater on site here for, uh, I guess, approaching seven years. And we use a, uh, a process that's uh, developed in Europe for breweries where we actually can produce a fairly valuable fuel from treating the wastewater. It's an anaerobic digestion process. And we produce a, a very high quality methane as a byproduct of treating our brewery wastewater. If you think that the term anaerobic digester sounds familiar, you're right. It's the same process that dairies are using to produce methane gas, which is then used to produce power. Methane is also produced at landfill sites. Just think of it. We can turn that smell from our dairies and our dumps into electricity and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. Well, right now, uh, the application for fuel cells worldwide uh, is starting to get quite a bit of attention for um, converting waste gas into electricity. So. Uh, both from harvesting um, um, landfill methane that's being generated from the decomposition of, of stuff in landfills. So there's a, a plant up in Washington State that's making electricity out of that, uh, as well as at wastewater treatment plants. Um, our process for wastewater treatment is what's called a, a primary anaerobic digester, and we get very high quality methane, meaning it's, it's uh, we've got a high BTU content. So it works very well in the fuel cells to make electricity. Is Ken saying what I think he's saying? That instead of paying for the natural gas and oil we use to make electricity, we could be getting it for free from our dumps and dairies? Wow. The fuel cells here at the brewery are located on the opposite end of the plant from the wastewater treatment station. So the methane gas is piped across the plant to be turned into electricity by these, the fuel cells. We've got uh, one of the largest installations in the United States of, of fuel cell uh, power generation, and they're a, a cogeneration fuel cell, meaning we both recover electricity from uh, the fuel cell process as well as the waste heat. Ken didn't mean to say waste heat. We have four individual 250 kilowatt fuel cells, and two of them can run methane right now as their uh, feed gas, and we're converting the other two over, so within the next month or so, all four of them will be able to generate electricity out of methane. And just how do you do that? How does one go about turning sewer gas into electricity? Well, here's how they do it with a fuel cell at the Sierra Nevada brewery. Usually, gas is burned in an engine that turns a shaft to generate electricity, just like in the engine of your car. But there is no combustion in a fuel cell. Instead, there's a series of chemical reactions which ultimately produce electricity, water, and heat. If a gas other than hydrogen is used, like methane, some CO2 is also produced. But even so, the process is much more efficient than combusting the fuel and way cleaner. You can think of a fuel cell as sort of a gas battery. Here's how a fuel cell works. Hydrogen gas, H2, 
is supplied to the cell stack where it encounters a catalyst. The catalyst ionizes the hydrogen, which means the negatively charged electrons come off. After losing the electrons, the hydrogen atom is now positively charged, and so it moves towards the cathode, which is negatively charged. The thing that makes the fuel cell work is the proton exchange membrane, or PEM, which allows the positively charged protons across, but not the negatively charged electrons. The electrons are forced to travel around the membrane, creating an electric current. On the cathode side of the cell stack, the hydrogen is combined with oxygen from the air to form water and heat. Fuel cells actually are, are probably close to two-thirds of our energy needs. Um, and I mentioned they're a cogen unit, so we're recovering waste heat from that as well. So we're getting uh, a very high efficiency uh, out of that whole system. Uh, typically, if you were to buy grid-supplied electricity, uh, it may only be about 35% efficient by the time it gets to your door due to transmission line losses and power plant inefficiencies, uh, whereas we're probably double that with our own power generation on site and the ability to capture the waste heat from that process. So we're, we're close to 70% efficient. Ken is talking about distributed power. Instead of being generated at a power plant and then transmitted over power lines, electricity is generated right where it is needed. In facilities like hospitals, where a power outage can be catastrophic, the idea of on-site power generation is nothing new. They've always had backup generators. Distributed power is different in that these systems are designed to be permanent and supply up to 100% of the facility's needs. So as fuel cell technology improves and as the price of grid power goes up, distributed power becomes more and more attractive. One of the reasons we also chose the fuel cells is they're uh, very, very low emissions compared to other ways of generating power. Um, the fuel cells can either be fed natural gas or, or biogas, the methane, as we talked about. Um, but they're so efficient at converting that gas source into electricity that there'll be a lot less emissions than if you were to burn that in a, in a fossil plant. Uh, besides the fact that since you're not combusting the gas, there's uh, no nitrous oxides or sulfur dioxides that are uh, emitted. Even though this technology is expensive, you'd think that with all the benefits, other breweries would be doing it as well. But it turns out there are very few. Yeah, we're, we're one of two breweries worldwide who's uh, capturing methane and running it through fuel cells. Other breweries could do it. Not all of them have you know, anaerobic digesters, but the ones that do have that kind of wastewater treatment um, could capture methane. And some of those now are capturing methane and burning them in boilers. Uh, but uh, we've taken it one step further, or, or they're using it in a, in a more conventional engine generator where the, the methane replaces uh, diesel or gasoline to run a generator. So that's being done by um, at least one brewery I know of in the U.S. Um, a lot more emissions are generated when you burn the fuel versus running into a, a fuel cell. Sometimes there are drawbacks to new technology, and with fuel cells, it's mainly the cost. Ken is a businessman and he admits that he came very close to not doing it. He remembers the nerve-wracking process of deciding what to do. As we sort of honed in on technologies that we thought would be uh, a good way to go, it, it came down to just two, which one was a, a natural gas-fired engine generator, which could also use methane, uh, and then the fuel cell. It was a, actually a fairly long process. I uh, almost bought the engine generator. The fuel cell's ability to, to much more efficiently convert the, the gas sources, whether it be methane or natural gas, into electricity, as well as the fact that the emissions were significantly lower, really made me focus on the fuel cells. Uh, it took uh, several weeks of negotiations, and we finally came up with something that was both reasonably cost-effective, although it was more than we would have paid to buy the simpler technology. Um, the, the environmental benefits and the efficiency benefits um, really balanced out the, the overall equation. While the brewery makes cattle feed and electricity on the side, its main job is making beer, which it does very well. But there's a byproduct of making beer that we've been having problems with, the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. This isn't to say that global warming is the beer's fault. CO2 just happens to be produced when we burn gasoline, and diesel, and coal, which we burn a lot of. I think most people would probably agree that they'd rather give up their gas-guzzling cars 
than give up guzzling a fine beer. I think pretty much the the um, jury is is in as far as that you know, there are, there are some effects that we're causing and uh, we're certainly contributed to uh, the global warming and CO2 emissions. So. I think at this point most everybody has uh, acknowledged at least that, that that is happening and that we are part of the problem. Um, but it, it took quite a while I think from uh, when evidence was starting to, to be proven till uh, this last year I think for really there to be a pretty wholesale shift in, in thinking by at least by our government. A lot of the rest of the world is, is much more progressive than the U.S. is I think when we're focusing on, on climate change. Uh, and it affects some countries certainly a lot more than it may affect us, countries that are very low, uh, uh, you know, very close to ocean level right now are going to, you know, certainly see some impacts if the ocean levels rise very much at all. The atmosphere can't tell the difference between carbon dioxide made from beer or coming out of the tailpipe of a blazer. And Ken realizes we need to do something about it. So leave it to Ken to figure out a way to sell something we already have too much of. During the fermentation process, carbon dioxide is one of the byproducts. When the malt sugar gets converted into alcohol for the beer, it also uh, releases carbon dioxide. And we're now capturing that from the fermentation process, compressing it and, and using it around the brewery to, uh, to bottle with and other uses as well. We'll have some surplus to sell at some point here in the future where we'll be able to supply soft drink manufacturers or other people who, who do use carbon dioxide. At this point, the, the quality of the CO2 that we capture from our own fermentation is, is much better than what would be purchased if you were to buy CO2 from a commercial CO2 company. So we have a better quality product. We're capturing our own emissions, which we think is a good thing. And eventually it'll probably save money, although it was certainly not driven by economics. We have focused a great deal on technologies that can help us conserve power and resources. But even with all these incredible machines, Ken doesn't think that technology alone is the answer. I mean, certainly technology will be part of the solution. You know, a lot of it, though, has to do with the mindset of people who are using energy and, and uh, you know, driving large cars. There's some shift that's going to have to be done, I think. For several years, we've uh, been looking at, at, you know, everything that we have that uses electricity. So we've replaced a lot of motors. We've put in variable speed drive so we uh, you know, don't have to run a motor at 100% speed when we're only needing it to produce 60% of its output. Part of it has to do with a, a cost uh, benefit. Uh, you know, as, as energy keeps going up, uh, people will start p paying more attention to some of the things that are using electricity and, and doing things like turning off lights and, and trying con to conserve that way. We've upgraded all of our lighting here at the brewery to uh, lower emission lighting uh, or lower energy usage lighting. There are some countries and even states that are now talking about banning the incandescent bulb. You know, there's probably not going to be a silver bullet that solves all of our uh, energy needs and, and uses, but you know, using a combination of things I think is really the, the way to go. And that's exactly what they're doing. Right across the street from the brewery is a parking facility that's literally covered with a photovoltaic array. These panels produce electricity which help power the plant during the day. It actually works very well with the brewery's energy usage patterns. Um, at night right now the, the fuel cell supply our, our base load on a 24-7 and at night we're basically able to uh, to cover all of our energy needs uh, with the fuel cells. Uh, we've got uh, higher uses during the day with both the, some of the production things that are scheduled uh, for day shifts as well as uh, our restaurant operations and offices and things like that that are uh, using more power during the daytime. So adding the, the solar cell with the fuel cells will actually help balance our energy production versus our energy usage quite well. While they practice recycling, energy conservation, and make their own methane for their fuel cells to make the electricity to run the brewery to make the beer, they still have to get the beer to the store. Right now, that still means using trucks, but that could be changing soon. We've actually been looking and starting to use rail, um, which can move a lot more pounds of goods for a lot lower energy. Um, uh, a horsepower on, a, on a, a rail versus a horsepower on a truck, uh, you can move significantly greater amounts of, of uh, material. So all of our malt is now being delivered by rail. Uh, we're starting to ship our beer out by rail on um, a piggyback kind of uh, carrier uh, intermodal where the, 
the truck trailer sits on the rail, goes close to the destination, and then gets off and, and um, gets taken to the final destination by a, a, a tractor. So, so that combination is, is a lot more efficient as far as energy usage as well. We've let our, our rail system um, sort of uh, uh, fall, fall into some disarray over the last uh, 50 years, but um, there certainly is a lot greater efficiencies to be had than, than driving you know, thousands of trucks around on roads. Ken realizes that when it comes to sustainability in business, we've got a long way to go. He recognizes the need for incentives. If it hadn't been for programs by the state of California and PG&E, the brewery probably wouldn't have become the showcase of sustainability that it is today. In addition to the photovoltaic panels that cover the parking area, there is another huge array covering the roof of the warehouse. In combination, the fuel cells and the solar panels produce nearly all the power the brewery needs. You know, we're not perfect, so I, I won't say that we're the perfect model, but, uh, you know, certainly some of the things we have done have, have been uh, noticed by other business people, and we get a tremendous amount of people touring our facility to take a look at some of the things we're, we're working on and doing. Arnold has been here, um, and uh, we received, uh, um, you know, a fair amount of accolades for some of the projects we've done. So can a beer save the world? Oh, that's a uh, that's a little bit of a uh, of a big statement as far as uh, as our uh, as our brewery and our beer, but I think we can certainly do our part and contribute to, uh, or hopefully not contribute uh, uh, to a lot of the problems that we're seeing from um, CO2 emissions and other things that that businesses do or that people do just in living. So, uh, you know, I think uh, you know everybody needs to do their part, and, and we're trying to do ours. We're uh, continually looking at things we can do to improve what we're doing. So it, it's not a, a done deal by any means with our organization and, and you know, how we use energy and how we use resources. But you know, I think everybody should be making some effort to, to look at what they're doing and trying to figure out how to do a better job. Every day we learn more about the effect we're having on our planet. From the chemicals we use to help grow our food, to the fuels we burn to drive our cars and heat our homes. Fortunately, we are also learning a lot about how to live in much greater harmony with our environment and real world examples like the Sierra Nevada Brewery are showing us how all of the parts of this sometimes complicated process can fit together in a continual sustainable cycle. From all of us here at Green Planet, thanks for watching. Thank you.